Welcome back guys, this is part two of the go-kart build, I think we're all doing well, get out of the way! I hope you're enjoying it, let's finish this car off, remember kids, don't drink and drive, you don't want to spill a good beer. So welcome back guys, this is part two of the kart build. Uh, thanks very much for joining us, hope you're well. If you missed part one at all, I'll pop a link in the description so you can go back and see part one where we installed the tank, seat, floor tray, rear axle, including the brake and the pedals and front bumpers at the front end. So in this episode we're going to finish it off, put the engines on, get it running and started. And so yeah, let's, uh, let's crack on. This is the point we got up to last time where we just fitted the uh, throttle cable bracket on the side of the chassis. So that's now on, and the next part to install is the steering column. So here we can see the steering column lower bearing just fitted into the housing of the circuit to retain it. And here is the steering column itself. Now we've got a locking ring on this steering column which slides up underneath as a security measure. And here we've got an aluminium steering column boss which has actually got a removable needle roller inside. So that's been taken out, cleaned and re-greased, ready for installation. And this slides over the steering column and the steering column simply slides down through the bearing in the chassis with a retaining bolt or retaining nut, I should say, on the bottom side to stop it coming through. The column mounting is just bolted in through the chassis legs with the NASA panel brackets on. Now, at this point, these are only nipped up. They're not fully tightened. We'll wait until we've got the, the bodywork on and we've got it all aligned properly before we actually fully tighten it. Again, these are fitted with Nordlock washers as it's quite a common part that comes loose during a race. Now the locking ring slides up. This is just there as an additional security measure. You have to run in most kart championships and if the nut comes off the lower part of the steering column, the column won't just pull out in your hands with no steering. So now we're moving on to the stub axle instalment. And this is the top caster base plate. These are, as we said before, sniper caster camber kits where there are others available. I like these ones because they tend to actually keep the position you set them in, whereas some others will move slightly through the vibration of use on track. Just need a little a little Bob Dobbelina of Loctite on there, just to drop these in with. Um, when you remove these, it's important just to get a little bit of heat on there, just to melt the Loctite, otherwise you can quite easily round the screws out. Now this is the stub axle arrangement. We can see on the left we've got the stub axle with the bearings, the spacers in the center with the nut, and the kingpin and spacers and flat washers on the right hand side. So in this arrangement, we've got the upper and lower base plates fitted. We'll fit the top plate. Then the kingpin will go through with the base washer, a spacing washer, through the stub axle itself, through both bearings. And then the same arrangement on the underside with the spacing washer and the base washer. You can see the spacing washer has beveled both sides, whereas the base washer has got a flat surface to sit within the chassis yoke. And then it's just with the washer and retaining nut. Now this is set up for uh, level ride height. Again, in another video, we've explained how to adjust your ride height using this system. This is just nipped up for the time being, not done fully tight because we are still going to set the uh, the wheel alignment on this car. I've obviously been drinking at this point, throwing the tools all over the floor. Now we're just going to slip the spacers on. 
important to note this inner one is not actually a spacer it's got a beveled edge which faces the kingpin and it has to go on the correct orientation and then we're just slipping the spacers on for the time being until we set the correct front width and fit the hubs Now to install the track rod, uh, you can see on this track rod the little marks on that nut, uh, that is because that nut and that end of the track rod is a left handed thread. So I always fit my left handed threads to the inside, so it's, they're both on the column side and the normal standard right handed thread on the outside. This is just a simple case of bolting them in with their correct spacers and again the other video but I'll put a link in the description, we'll cover how we can adjust this tracking and Ackerman angle etc to set the cart up for different circuits. Important once this is all bolted in, that the rose joint itself is nice and free and can just wobble side to side so it's not binding up on either the stub axle or the steering column where it bolts through. Now the right hand side is exactly the same so we're not going to film that but once you've got them both on you're then ready to do the wheel alignment on the cart. Now it's time to install the steering wheel so this steering wheel has got an angled boss on the back already fitted. You can see it's only got one hole because it's a, a larger M8 bolt. Some of them are M6 with two fixings. It's important when you install this bolt to install it facing downwards so if the nut does wobble loose at least you've still got a chance of the bolt staying in and the steering wheel staying attached to the column. There's absolutely nothing worse than either having a stuck open throttle or a steering wheel come off in your hands. So always ensure the bolt goes downwards. And as an extra security measure, I've got this little bit of tape, a little bit of silicon tape. That I'd just like to wrap around the nut and bolt once it's installed and then it should help to prevent it from rattling loose at all. It's also got a Nordlock washer on so this really really is belt and braces to stop the steering wheel working loose. Now we can see the steering wheel finally all installed. Now this little bit of fuel hose with the cable tie around the column is just to stop the track rods bashing into the column and potentially bending and vibrating on full lock which will be on quite a lot in the wet. So now time to install the engines. These have had the clutches removed and cleaned, fresh oil, fresh fuel lines fitted as they tend to become a little bit brittle with age. The carburetors have been cleaned out, all the float bowls have been taken off spark plugs been cleaned out and the air filter so they've just been given a once over given a good refresh and now they're going to be installed so slip your chain on and get your tension roughly correct and double check your alignment and then install your lower engine clamp some engines bolt through the chassis on these we've got uppers and lowers so we install the lower clamps then we just check the tension as we're nipping this down. As it pulls the engine square, it will adjust the tension. So we're checking the tension, spinning the axle until we're happy and we can finally nip it up fully tight. Continuously checking the tension. Now the tension you're happy with, the engine's bolted on. Tension's the same all the way around, so it's important to spin the axle and check that. Also a final check on the alignment. And then we're totally happy with that, we can then wind the engine stop up to the back of the engine and lock it off with his locking nut. It's important to do this after you've fitted the engine, as having this wound up before might not let the engine sit nice and square and parallel. It's just there in case the mounts work slightly loose to stop it rolling backwards. Now for the chain guards, these are just simple plastic chain guards, one bolt on the chassis and an R-clip on the engine bracket, previously being cut to the right size. Now 
and the right hand engine exactly the same. Now it's time to install the new fuel hose. So on this we've got a central tank which feeds two engines. So we have a Y-piece or T-piece connector, which inside the tank there is a pickup already fitted. A piece of fuel hose comes off. It's nice to put a loop in the top of this and run it down the chassis leg so that you can actually check for air bubbles as you're racing and see when you're starting to run out of fuel. And it's quite simply connects into the T-piece and tees off to each engine which has its own individual fuel filter. Sometimes these can be a little bit tight to fit in there so a little trick is just to warm the end of the pipe up, open it up ever so slightly with something like an allen key like this and the heat makes it a bit more flexible and then it should slip straight on. Once it cools down it will actually form an even better seal like this over your connection. We just temporarily pop that on there to get a length, a length measurement for the fuel pipe with the correct routing. And again, just warming it up to aid the fitting. Now we're installing the overflow bottle. Which again, this part goes on the front of the tank, the other outlet, and should any fuel overflow, it will go up in this pipe into this overflow bottle, and you also use this to pressurise the fuel system when you've removed the engines or refitted them. So you will take the pipe off of the overflow bottle, blow down it, which will pressurise the tank and force the fuel to flow out up to the engines. So not too tightly cable tied up as you need to remove that pipe to blow down. So as you blow down, you remove this pipe off the top, blow down that pipe, pressurises the tank, fuel comes out, the feed pipe through the T-piece, few fuel pipes, few fuel filters and into your engines. Now it's time to install the throttle cables. Important to make sure your fine adjustments there are wound all the way in to allow you the maximum amount of adjustment once they're installed. And this is the other end on the engine side where the cable will slot into. It will route down the outside of the car through these housings and up through the pedal. Two cables for two engines. You've got an inner and an outer cable, different length cables because obviously the left hand engine the cable has to travel further. Now the two inner cables come up with these locking devices on to lock the cable back on itself and a piece of fuel pipe. We slide each locking device down each cable and then we slide the pair, both the cables, through the piece of fuel pipe.
This is then installed through the pedal and you can choose your position, the same as the brake pedal, you can choose what fulcrum point you use for the throttle cable and then you squeeze the fuel pipe through the hole in the pedal as well. All this fuel pipe is there for is to stop any wear and tear or try and decrease the wear and tear on the cable where it wraps around the pedal. Without that fuel pipe, the cable, the inner cable is directly contacting the metal and it will wear the cable and potentially snap it a lot faster. So it's just a little, a little bit of protection there. We now need to slip the prospective cables back down the same one that they came up and slide the locking collar over both cables and then we'll pull the free play out of it and lock the two cables together. And we can see a nice amount of free play so it's not holding the throttles open. So now we'll cable tie the throttle pedal wide open and make sure we're achieving wide open throttle. See the cable routing there. Now you can see on the carburetor this little black throttle plate is up against its stop in the fully open position and as we release the cable tie you can see it going back. So you can confirm that you are achieving wide open throttle there. Now you can see it's fully open. Now you can see it's off completely, different position. So now we know we're achieving wide open throttle, we need to set the throttle stop so that we're not stretching the cables. Now in somebody's infinite wisdom, they've fitted a nice new shiny stainless bolt, but they've replaced it with an Allen bolt rather than the hex bolt that was there. That would be me. So hence we're now holding the other side of it as we can't get it out without removing the pedal. And one final point is don't tie the cables up too tight to any bodywork or chassis. You want a little bit of freedom there, a bit of movement so that you don't have a sticky throttle cable. You need to have nice linear bends and nothing too tight on the radius. The final thing to check would be to make sure both your throttles are opening at the same point and you can do that by holding the throttle arms on the engine while somebody operates the pedal and if they're slightly out of sync you can use the adjustment again on the side of the chassis where the outer cables run through just to fine tune that engagement. Time now to fit the bodywork. This is simply the side pod bars pushing through. Again the hand hammer in operation and they're just bolted through the chassis, through the plastic inserts. So on this right hand side pod we've got a cable tie installed there just to run this throttle cable through so that it's still nice and loose and free but it's not going to dra get dragged down underneath the cart should you go and do a bit of off-roading or have an incident like that. And time to install the nose cone, just remove the bumper clips, install the nose cone and refit the clips. Time for the NASA panel. This has little rubber inserts that just slide over the two brackets around the steering column and the lower one that's been bolted on the chassis and secured with an R clip, again pointing downwards so that it doesn't rattle and fall out. We 
we're going to pop these front hubs on we're going to run this with 15 millimeters of spacing so we've got a mixture there of 5, 10 and 15 mil spacers don't forget your beveled washer which goes on first 15 mil spacer front hub and the remaining spacers again this is covered in more depth in another video but the most important key point when fitting these is to not tighten them up fully so that you can press the bearings and stop the hub from spinning so you want to nip them up and you can see the spacers aren't rotating they're stiff and then back it off slightly until you get the spacers moving and spinning nice and freely on the stud axle shaft and you see there the spacers are moving now but you don't have any end float or side to side play in the hub itself that is the correct way to set the front end up one of the last jobs is to install the rear bumper simply bolts through the chassis And last but not least, the rear number board. Now this is on, the cart's complete, and we can get it outside, have a good look around it, and fire these motors up. There she is then guys, all complete, all ready, all back together. Looking splendid outside in the sunshine. Red motors have got all fresh oil in and running lovely. And yeah, ready for some track action. Hopefully this has been of some use to some people and uh, hopefully you've enjoyed it guys. It's been a, a good project to put back together. Let's hopefully get it out on track soon. Thanks very much for watching. Look after yourselves. Ta-ta!